Welcome to session three. I know some of you, I think have been, maybe all of you have been here for the other two sessions. This is three of four. And of course, this effort is to, uh, for the district to be able to achieve the, uh, the district of distinction uh, uh, certification from the California Special Districts Association. As you see tonight, you have a green stack. So if when you get to your binders, remember the binders we handed out the first one, the blue stack was last time. The green stack just goes right after the blue stack. So it should be reasonably clear how that works. And we're going to work on a couple of different uh, topics tonight. Uh, I didn't know if there were going to be anybody here that perhaps some public or perhaps uh, uh, board members, I mean trustees that hadn't been here. And so I just wanted to put that out again. Um, tonight we're going to work on teamwork and communications. And then we have one more that will more than likely be in February unless something comes up that on your agenda that precludes that. And we'll be thinking about the future of the district strategically. And so these are the topics that are left tonight. Again, we'll work on teamwork and communication. So an overview, as you know, uh, I, I am uh, compelled to list this for you every time. Uh, the Leadership Academy uh, is the, oh, the overview. The goal is the, of the, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about the goals and the key components, the four stages and so forth. We've already talked a lot about this stuff in the earlier sessions. But the idea is for board members, trustees, to be able to come away with the skills and knowledge that'll enable you to simply understand your role and do as good a job as you can for the public you serve. I can't help it, uh, but notice how hard you're trying as a district to really reach your community with all of the really great services that you provide. Uh, as was pointed out tonight, uh, it's not easy. It's not easy to get people to pay attention. And, uh, but when they need you, they need you bad and they get the services they need. And that is a great message. And so you should continue to feel good about that. Even other mosquito vector control districts have difficulty in reaching their constituency with so many, I mean, they do the thing, they do their work every day. They do their work out in the field and that gets done. But there are times when you really hope that they're, that the message is getting out. And I applaud you for your uh, obvious efforts in terms of getting the word out for uh, your district and the, the, what the public's money really goes to do. Remember, the, it's about the mission and we talk so much about the mission. And this is why the public's money gets collected for you to be able to direct in to specific areas of service. And uh, you do a great job there. Again, it starts with a great effective governance team. So the topics, the importance and necessity of board teamwork and board communications. Okay, so it's easy to start with what seems to be the kinds of things that oftentimes take the board out of their lane, take the board out of the effective position of being as good as they can be. You know as well as I do that no board is as good as it can be when it's in conflict. Now, certain amounts of conflict is good. We will have disagreements among us. We will have different perspectives. And that conflict is good if it's processed well. We've talked about that before. It's about processing conflict to a better, higher level output. And a certain amount of conflict is good. It's the insulting, the the ineffective, dysfunctional, lack of civil discourse conflict that you've seen, maybe hopefully never experienced, that's what really begins getting in the way of effective public uh, service. And you all, by, by nature of what you're, you have me doing here, are trying very hard to work on that and doing an excellent job. So maintaining trust Trust is such a big word. It's, it's in the middle of your title, you have your name, of your role. But be good to your word. Being good to your word means that 
you will be uh, a leader that is simply trustworthy. But effective boards always keep things uh, that are confidential, confidential. Effective boards uh, respect one another. And that's not always easy because certainly we all know that there are, <laughs> one thing we know about uh, putting a number of people in a room together and asking them to make decisions is that they're oftentimes going to disagree. It's how we disagree, the f if they're, we, we're finding functional ways to disagree, uh, finding ways to draw each other out. Um, is, is, the big, uh, is the big challenge for so many of us. And the more you get in the room, it can go either way. I've seen work with some boards with as large like yours, 25 boards, where they don't have any conflict because they don't engage. I have other smaller boards, and many of us know of five member councils and boards and so forth, and they conflict by just the moment they get together. Uh, maybe it was a campaign mode that got them to begin conflicting. Maybe it was uh, some uh, um, disrespect from the podium prior to being elected. But the fact is, when the public puts us all on a dais in one way or another, whether it's appointed or elected, our job is to try our best to, because to be leaders in the community. As I said before, I think we did this math last time, that even though this is a huge district in terms of its, of its geographic area, and there are many, many public agencies, the fact is there aren't that many. The, the percentage of, of public leaders in your area is still very, very minuscule. It's very fractional. And so you're one of a, of a, of a rare species here in Marin and Sonoma County that are set aside as leaders. And so if you're going to be an effective leader, you, the best leaders, the best boards are trustworthy. The best boards work together through conflict. The best boards maintain, uh, an, uh, they can, func uh, uh, they can uh, functionally conflict uh, and it's not always easy. Um, but you're given, the, you're given um, a, quite a bit of authority here in terms of spending the public's dollar and with that comes quite a bit of responsibility. But it can be a huge is issue and confidentiality can be a huge issue, a trust buster, a resource waster. The trust bucket's an interesting little, uh, uh, little thing because the trust bucket fills really slowly, you know, and you finally get to trust somebody much less a group of people, but it's so easy to kick that bucket over. Uh, it's so easy to get to where you say something that you can't believe came out of your mouth and now it's out there and you just can't get it back in. And the trust is broken. The trust is questioned, the tr trust is, is, is uh, questioned and so, um, how important is it that the team work together, that it trusts one another to be able to work together in the highest, uh, in, in the highest way? Well, it, it's a, it needs to be that we pay attention to those things. Remember we talked last time, I think as well, about nonverbal communications and how important or how, how easy it is for us to uh, send a message to others that we don't care or that we don't believe it or that we really don't respect their opinion just by saying, mm, just that, just the, you know, if somebody's stating a, a, a position or a concept or their initiative or, uh, or you know, any, anything that, that is on the mind of a board member and puts them in a particular position, someone else across the room rolling their eyes can have a big effect. And so while it's, it's, there are other places in this talk where we talk about how big of an effect we have as, as decision makers, as a board. And so as we get ourselves together in this kind of a team, it's oftentimes important, it's always important to remember how we conduct ourselves. Um, and there are five successes of a team. Celebrate results, encouraging uh, setting goals and, and, and things like that that, that, we, that we can celebrate when we reach those targets. 
uh, for the good of the team. Uh, it, this attracts, by the way, there's another benefit, there's another real um, a part of the strategy of being able to do public service right is to be able to be attractive to the best employees out there. When you think about it, you want to have uh, the best way for the public's dollar to get a bang for its buck is to have employees that are real that care as much as you do about this place, that care as much as Phil does about this place. And team orientation, encouraging, setting and, encur and encouraging the uh, celebration of goals is a very attractive to, uh, to good employees. employees. Good employees, when they're looking around it for a job, they know how to do their homework. The ones that know they're good, they really uh, can often call their shots. It doesn't take much for them to uh, be recruited and, and moved. And so those best ones are oftentimes uh, attracted to team oriented. That team orientation starts here. If there's discord here, it can be unfortunately trickled down into your, uh, uh, into your, uh, uh, into your workforce. And, and that's, again, just as functional. So instead, you celebrate your own results here, the kinds of things you've done. For instance, I know in the last couple of years, you've worked real hard on your board policy manual. When that finally you know, got approved, and when all those changes got, that's, that's, it seems a little strange, but it really is worthy of celebration. It's, e it's easier to have my perspective because I see so many agencies out there that don't spend the time and don't have those kinds of really great policies and, and don't spend, don't have that in their repertoire or their, their protection when they need it. And so it's really important. That was a, something I hope that you some of you I know did celebrate because I know how hard you worked on, on that, uh, that particular uh, result. And then to promote accountability, unifies team members with a common standard of performance, allows leaders to focus on, um, on leading the team and encourages excellence. Accountability is something that our public expects of us and we expect a fill, uh, you as a group, you as a uh, as Phil's uh, boss expect of him, and he should expect of his employees. And so accountability, it really is a unifying thing. Uh, lack of accountability can really fragment any kind of organization. But uh, uh, it really does encourage excellence, and that's what we're always after here in public service. Moving on with the five successes of a team, encourage commitment. It reinforces decisions and creates an atmosphere of dependability. What, what a great word to attach to a public agency is dependability. Uh, that your entire constituency could, if they could come up with one word that described the, the Mosquito Vector Control District, to say dependability. They're dependable. You, when we call them, we get what we need. We, we depend on them. They are dependable. And you do that by setting clear goals and priorities, encouraging that commitment, not only just here, but also through fill down to the workforce. And valuing conflict. I talked a little earlier about conflict. Conflict is healthy and can facilitate resolution. I use the, uh, and sometimes I get um, a little confused about whether I use this analogy with you all before or not. But there was this, this kind of, grinder process that I explained is any substantive decision that you've got before you goes into a process and the chair basically is the one the president of the board is the one that utilizes that process to get a decision from a group and that process needs to be consistent and it needs to be transparent and it needs to be open. It needs to allow for conflict. But eventually, at the end of the process, it comes to a vote. And that process should be the same every time. But if it's open, if it's safe, then for you all to be able to participate in every time, that allows you 
to explore the edges of ideas and with innovation, with ideas, with your thoughts, your perspectives. Sometimes that can lead to some conflict, but if it's processed right, if it keeps getting put through that grinder every time in the right way, in a consistent fashion, then it basically comes, the output of that is a, an improved decision. A, a, a decision that has now been kind of scrubbed in the process. And every one of you have valuable input to the decisions that you, uh, that you make. Now, you may not want to engage every one of you every time, but every one of you should be able to engage every time, and it should be obvious to everyone that they can, even if it does conflict. Part of the reason that's true is because you all believe in that. Your common ground, your, your roots are right here. And if you all believe that about one another, if you all believe that about Phil, if Phil believes that about all the employees, then you can allow for that kind of interaction as a team. Teams that distrust one another pull back. If you don't feel safe in putting your ideas forward, if you don't feel safe in being able to comment on your perspective, that's when ideas and innovation gets peeled back. And so it's really important to allow for that conflict. And the way you do it is openness, an environment where back-channel politics and personal attacks won't survive. And we all know, we've all been around long enough to know, we've seen places where there are where there are personal attacks and back-channel politics. That is, a, that is just the enemy of open dialogue and innovation and being able to work that output as a team. And so it's really important that you continually work on creating that environment. And of course, that begins to have an effect over the team um, effectively manage behaviors of the members that hurt the team. In other words, the, the opposite of good open dialogue or any kinds of personal attacks or any kinds of, boy, I, I don't know that I've seen it all. I'd never say I've seen it all anymore, but I've seen a lot in terms of how board members can, or trustees can treat one another. And it's very uh, discouraging at times. It's very discouraging to see leaders in the community act like they really don't belong there. And you know that somehow we, the public, are losing in that. And so creating an environment that allows for something better, that says, no, everyone's, everyone's co-equal here in their opinion, Everyone, everyone's opinion is welcome, our process allows for it, and Mr. new Mr. Chair, Mr. Mr. President, you are the one kind of that has the handle on that process, on how that works every time. Are we sure? And I saw you do it tonight. Everybody, anybody want to comment on this? Any other thoughts before we vote? And it's really that simple, but even that simple thing isn't, doesn't exist in some, in some places because you sense, you sense all this other stuff that having already gone out, the back channel stuff, the personal attacks, the, the fear of being able to throw my idea in. And so a team doesn't work very well that way, and so that's why it's important to, again, create that environment. And then create trust. We've talked about, uh, we've talked about celebrating results and promoting accountability, encouraging commitment, valuing the conflict, and now creating trust can safely share weaknesses and mistakes with one another. Um, one of the ways I learned this, and I think, again, I don't know if I told this story before, but when I was, uh, I, I served for 23 years on our city council, and when I was probably in year 17, 18, I finally learned that I should ask the questions that I thought were something I probably ought to know already. I think I maybe have told you this a couple months ago. But you know, it's funny how you feel like, golly, I've been here for five years, 10 years, name it. And you say, if I ask that question, it's going to say something about me, but maybe I 
didn't pay attention enough. Maybe I missed the true meaning of that. Maybe I just didn't understand. Maybe I just didn't hear. But to be a, when I asked those, when I started asking those questions, I kind of said, "Look, I'm. Uh, forgive me. I probably should know this. I remember talking to, this, to you know during the." During the development decision time, anyone from the council wishing to address this matter, uh, when I'd ask the city attorney or the city manager, ah, I'm sorry, you guys, let, let's back this up. And it would have been easy for me to say, you know, the public's here, they may not understand, but really it was me. I got to a point where I knew that that it was a bond issuance or something, and the terminology was just, maybe I was just tired at the time. But I noticed that I had to ask, there was something that didn't add up to me in my head. And I thought, gee, if I ask that question, people out there are going to think, I, I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm, what have you been doing for seven or eight years? Well, I asked the question anyway. And I started that, that meeting asking the question a lot. And after that meeting, Two other council members came up to me and said, I'm so glad you asked that question because that I didn't know either. And look, there's a lot to this stuff. It's not, um, I, I'm sure some of you feel, at, at, have felt at some point in time, how much you didn't know about this, about mosquito vector control. She got here and all of a sudden they're using terminology, they're using, they're talking about materials and species that I've never heard of and now I'm supposed to make decisions about them. And, and it, the same is true for any public service you do. Anytime you walk through that door, you're not expected to know everything at the beginning, although for some reason it's easy to feel that way. Well, I've got the mantle now, I should pretty much know what's going on. No, that's not true. And it's a humbling experience to be able to do this, but it's a very important to be able to safely share, eh, maybe it wasn't weaknesses or mistakes so much as my, I, I felt safe in being able, and it, it took, it was an acquired skill. I had to work on it a little bit before I felt comfortable, but. I ask more and more questions all the time. Now, staff would say, mm, look, uh, do you have any? <laughs> they'd call me ahead of the meetings and they'd say, do you have any questions on this? Because we want to make sure that there's any terminology you don't understand or something like that. And so eventually, you know, they, they actually got the word too that it's really important to make sure that the terminology is in consumable bytes or that the speed at which a process is going to take place is a speed at which I, who visit once in a while, even as the mayor, when I was the mayor, really, I was there six or seven times a week. They're there 40, sometimes more hours a week, work just grinding away. And some of those things that they know, some of those things that they're doing, and some of those things that they're processing are really moving a lot faster than I can keep up with. And so I need for them to be able to explain. I need to be able to stop them when I, when I feel good about that. But it builds faith in others' intentions and aptitudes at times, instills confidence, and encourages taking risks. Um, I'm sure some of you have seen or read books by, ooh, sorry, uh, Lencioni. Um, he, uh, he has written a number of books on teamwork. And I just thought this would a, a, be a, a really great uh, piece here for us to talk about a little bit. But there's a price to pay for pe petty politics. And petty politics oftentimes is fraught with this kind of, this kind, these kinds of uh, uh, concepts. Inattention to results, avoidance of accountability, lack of commitment, fear of conflict. <sighs> Well, I could talk a whole class on local decision makers and their fear of conflict. In some respects, it's a gift to conflict because it opens things up that we can so easily just run by and not fully consider. And so this fear of conflict, um, 
I know you all have been involved over the years in raising rates. How, nobody, it's hard to even send the message at times to our constituents that we don't like raising rates, we'd rather not raise rates. In some respects though, at some times we have to. But that moment where it's built to a head and we get before people and we hear their testimony and we have to have that conflict, maybe with our constituents, maybe with one another, is, is a real test of a board's ability to be able to, to kind of high perform. The highest performers don't fear conflict, they use conflict to their advantage. And certainly the absence of trust, the fear of being vulnerable to team members and prevents from building trust within the team. But these, these dysfunctions can be just as resident in, in this kind of a team as they can be in any other kind of a team. And so some conflict, some conflict and some of these things are unavoidable when you put this many people together. Remember we called it early on an arranged marriage where you're kind of shoved into a room and asked to make good decisions not just good decisions, the best decisions. And the best decisions, that's a relative term, isn't it? What's best, which is best? Sometimes it's a little of this, sometimes a little of that. I can distinctly remember sitting on the dais and hearing from the expert on this side of the room with all the appropriate letters behind his name, and he'd get up and say, this is the worst thing you could ever do. Council, you really need to avoid a, a, a moving forward on this decision. And then another expert from this side of the room with the same letters beyond their name, with the same degrees and the same high level of experience saying, this is the best, you, you need to do this. And it's left with these five or these 21 or the, however many people, this many people to somehow parse that out. Those that visit on occasion, those that, hear a staff report and get the information and try their best to put it all together and then work it out among us. Um, how important it is at that point in time to be able to roll that around and grind that through the process and then come out to where you feel comfortable with the decision. And you won't always feel comfortable with every decision. But you don't want to do anything that would diminish the ability of this board or this agency to function at the highest level. And so that's why you're here. And again, kudos to you, not very many mosquito vector control districts seek the district of distinction. And so uh, uh, certificate, so congratulations. Um, you're, as a director, as a tr trustee in your case, you're prepared. You mean you do your homework, you work hard, you commit the time and energy required to be effective. And of course that's real, I mean you all just did uh, committee uh, assignments tonight. Some of those are committees are meet maybe two or three times a year and some of those committees meet all the time. And some of you understand uh, the details and have to do a deep dive in the area of finance and other places perhaps and some of you maybe never have. But it does take time. It does, and like I said, that this, this train's moving fast and sometimes you have to run very quickly just to get on board, much less understand the whole thing. But the fact is you're doing your homework and working hard. This is not, and I know some of you have certainly served elsewhere as mayor and council members and other places I know you have, and, I, and you know how much hard, you really can't put all the time in that you'd like to. It seems like you're, you can, you could be there 40 hours a week and it wouldn't quite be enough because you're serving the public. You're doing something for them, not for you. And it is hard work. And you don't know until you get on your side of the dais how hard it is, what the feeling of responsibility is, what the feeling of accountability, what the feeling of trying to do your best for your community. And so committing that time and energy required is just part of being prepared. And then govern with dignity and understand the implications of demeanor and behavior. We talked about that. Uh, treat others with openness and respect, especially those you disagree with. That's probably the hardest thing. Um, 
dis finding ways to be able to manage through disagreement is, uh, is a really great skill. Um, communication, though, of course, as we said, is, can be both um, verbal and nonverbal. Be attentive when others are talking. This, this, again, is a, I believe, some people are much better. Have you noticed that? Some people are much better listeners than others. But nobody ever gets criticized for listening too much. <coughs> Quietly listening, thinking, studying, taking it all in. What do we call that? We call that, you, you kind of start looking at those people as wise, as introspective, as kind of really professional level, got it together kind of people. Those that really do the work and those that really listen. It's so easy in this kind of society to listen to solve rather than listen to understand. And listening to understand is a whole different thing. And it's a hugely important skill in a board because the idea is you listen to try to understand that there might be something that your position forgot. There might be a perspective you didn't, you had a blind spot to. It's, it's not the easiest thing to do, but I, but I believe if you practice listening, you'll never be criticized for it. <clears throat> Critical to institutionalized unity of purpose. We talked about unity of purpose, and I believe, in the first uh, session of this. And unity of purpose, really, here's your purpose statement. Unifying around that allows you someplace a allows you a position to, to all come together, that common ground. And that common ground is so important when the hard, you know, there's a lot of easy decisions we make. Usually a group of, of uh, uh, elected or appointed officials spend about four years together, and it's oftentimes more, but usually about four. And in that time, usually it's about 200 to 250 decisions they have to make together. And the team, that decision-making team, needs to be as good at making, as, as high functioning on decision number 250 as they are on decision number one. And that says we're gonna take our differences and process them for the good of the public. And so it's, it's a really interesting thing to be able to get that unity of purpose. And the reason we can believe that about our colleagues is because we all believe this. This is why we exist. This is what we're supposed to do. This needs to be done today, tomorrow, next year, 10 years from now. This needs to be viable for how long into the future? Right. It needs to be continually, it's perpetual. It needs to always be there. There should always, I don't know how I can imagine a scenario where you could do without a mosquito vector control district. But you can certainly look back 100 years and you can see what it was like then and say, well, we're never letting it get there again. In fact, as the challenges come along, and you, you all get some very interesting challenges. As they come along, we're going to be prepared to deal with it for our community. That's our job. That's what we do. We're going to be, pre be prepared today, tomorrow, and in perpetuity because we have this uni unity of purpose. And institutionalizing it means that you talk about it, you realize it, you, you integrate it to the things that you do in your policies, in your belief statements, your credos, norms. In, in your case, it's in your, uh, it's in your policy. And so the team needs to coalesce around this. It needs to continually consider the unity of purpose. It needs to allow the unity of purpose to be the common ground when we may disagree. Need to have process that allows us to be able to integrate that and be able to take full advantage of all the perspective that sits around the table. Okay. Effective board members always communicate with respect. 
Do you believe that? Is that true? Is that a true statement? And how, what does that really look like? What do you think that looks like with respect? Have you ever heard anybody always kind of start, start their disagreement with, in all due respect? When did I hear that? I think I just heard this yesterday in a national thing. In all due respect. It's kind of, but I disagree. And here's why. Still, there's this modicum of understanding that we're all in this together by saying, in all due respect. Now, it can be easy. It's easy to say. It may be harder to really internalize and believe. But in all due respect, I submit that this is, this is the kind of way it ought to work. We need to understand and communicate with respect because we're all in this together. And that's what the public expects of us. It's not always easy. <laughs> uh, one might say, well, people around me need to act respectable before I'm going to respect them. <laughs> and isn't that, isn't that an interesting way of looking at it? Because when I look around, when I don't have any, uh, nor do you have any magic dial that says I'm only going to sit on boards where I have respectable people around me. And I don't know if I've really got the criteria that nailed down. What is respectable to you? And so your tolerance level needs to perhaps be able to take that in, be able to process that. And we've all been around people that it's very difficult to respect. But as community leaders, we're the ones, remember, you're the ones right up here at the top of, of the heap. When people look around and point to people that are leaders in the community, you're in that group. And so they expect you to be able to find that. They expect you to be, I don't know if evolved is the word, but they expect you to be big enough to be able to take that, process it, work with it, work through it, work despite it in some cases. And it's hard. It really is difficult. And so you, you can see this at every level of, any kind of interaction. You can see it at a fast food checkout line where somebody's just treats you like dirt. <laughs> How in the world do they ever, do they keep that? No, they don't, maybe they don't keep their job, but my goodness, how can somebody be so gruff with a customer? But then you'll see the next five people that are just wonderful and, and you say, how in the world, what kind of training is somebody getting that allows them to be that way? You can see it with all the service industry. This one is not precluded from gathering in its sweep and how it puts uh, trustees together, how it puts boards together, how the public elects people to office that happen to fit all that criteria. So your tolerance level really does need to be the bands, the boundaries of your, poly, of your tolerance need to really be quite open when you get together. It, again, the, the, out of the 250 decisions that you'll make together, it may be 10 decisions that really test your mettle, that really kind of say, okay, all this was nice, but man, it's real. here's when it's going to get tested on this decision, on that decision. Um, and so how important is it at that moment to be able to process this great valued uh, uh, amount of great valued perspective, this great um, uh, thoughts and ideas and innovations that might, another way to look at things. That's the moment. That's the test. Clarity, uh, I, I guess I really accentuated that. Clarity is really important. <laughs> Have you ever noticed that? How important is clarity? It's the intention of communication. Its intention of the communication is to be clear, is to clearly send a message, or at least to, to make sure that somebody understands what you're trying to say or what you're trying to communicate. And there's so many ways that we communicate here in a public agency. 
And so there's clarity in all of them are important. It's the most important word in management. Now, that's probably something that could be disputed. But from my point of view as an organizational consultant, and I work with staffs, and I work with the, the interaction of managers to staff, and I work with the interaction of board to manager, and usually when I get called in, it's not because everything's rosy and perfect. It's usually because there's a problem. This is a good one because I get to train you all in concepts and, and positive things. But usually when I get called in, it's because there's a problem. And usually when you take that problem apart, you unravel the knots of that problem, and it takes a while to do that, that kind of that root cause thing, you usually find that there was some poor communication, somebody that didn't communicate properly, someone that didn't understand their job description because somebody else didn't communicate properly, or somebody who didn't bother to put together, hired somebody and never told them this was part of their job, someone that never said, and you need to be able to get along with your coworkers, job descriptions that really mention the lots and lots of tasks and duties, but don't mention what it means to interact functionally with your coworkers, it almost always gets down to some poor communication at the root. Problem is that horse is out of the barn. The poor communication has already happened, and that poor communication resulted in dysfunction and kind of this separation and then have been leveraged by other people that kind of like the separation. And it gets worse and worse. And then they say, ah, my goodness, it's a mess. Let's call somebody. Uh, it, when you get back to that, you have to almost restart the whole thing. Clarity of expectations, of direction, of understanding, clarity of performance, clarity of results. These are reasonable things for us to be able to have a handle on, right? True. But... Sometimes it's so easy to just kind of, look, I understand what I'm saying. You ought to. I'm moving on. <coughs> this is a public agency organizational model. There's the owners, the public out there. They're all shapes and sizes. And there's the elected or appointed board or representative. That's you, five or 25 or however many that a particular board has. And you're their representatives. And then it gets down to the CEO and the manager. <laughs> yeah, right at that, call it what you want, the focal point, the, the orifice. <laughs> call it what, but it is that central node. And that's drawn that way for a reason. Because the communication lines ought to go down through that person. There's a reason for that. So it's about communication, this section of the talk. And so communication there. And then there's this, the professionals. So you've got the owners, the representatives, the executive, and the professionals. Think about the places, the number of places where communications can come apart in this model. Communications among them, do they always agree? Do they always, com do they even communicate at times? There's some little groups and there's other little that, that are in different places. They don't always agree and communicate. Do they communicate well with you? Maybe sometimes. Some of them certainly do. They let you have it and tell you what they think. Some of them have good ideas and perspective that maybe you hadn't thought of. Then there's you all. Do you always communicate well? Do you communicate appropriately? Uh, then there's the, 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 the uh, uh, connection between you and your executive. Now that's a formal relationship there. You are the holder of Phil's contract collectively. And so it's really important for him that he has clarity, isn't it? So, how many of you have ever had a bad boss? You all are the boss. Not just one of you, not just the committee, but all of you are the boss. Think how difficult it is at times, and I'm not just, it's not just for Phil, to be able to make sure that he's running right down the middle of the lane, exactly the right direction. 
and that you all have a process that, that really does collect that and understand that. And so there's communication here. Then there's communication between him and all these people down here. Now note, I didn't say there's any communication here. Well, there can be some. I mean, I Don, we, we talk to Don and we know her and we, yeah, I know, I put her on the spot. But there's that kind of communication and certainly you all do interact with Don as the, as the board clerk. But, but other, the communication between you and them is a controlled interface. It's very specific and very careful. There's reasons for that. Then there's a the communication among them, which is Phil's sometimes blessing, sometimes this is nightmare. <laughs> because, you know, you've got a whole staff of people out there that I've heard there can be rumor mills. I've heard that there can be things that start and go up and down. And so there's plenty of places in this organizational model for communications to get challenged. And so it's so important that we think about that and understand that as the leaders, the publicly appointed leaders of this organization with that mission that we communicate. If we don't communicate, what happens? How should we communicate? All those things come into play. So there's board to staff, there's staff to board, there's board to manager, there's manager to board, there's communicating with the public, communicating district direction, communication through policies and protocols. Let's talk about it. One of the most difficult is this is board to staff. This is board to the rank and file staff, okay? That's what this one is about. One of the most difficult and damaging areas. There's reasons for that, and that board member should be very careful in how and when they communicate with staff. Only because of the edges that are unseen. Only because of the authorities that are under uh, under, uh, not well understood. When you walk through, any one of you walks through the back, it means something to those employees. Those employees say, uh, board member on the, trustee on the floor, you know, I mean, it, but it does, it means something to them. That can feel really great. I remember when I used to, when I was the mayor and I show up at the wastewater treatment plant, man, it's like they stood at attention. I didn't want that. That's not what I was after. But that's what they did. And they talk about it for weeks. I don't, I don't get that, but I, maybe I do get that. The fact is, you're, if anybody sees you as leaders, it's the staff here. And so when you show up or when you're walking around the offices, it means something. And if you say some little thing, it could be taken in a, in a good way or a bad way. And, and so being, all I'm saying is being careful. I think, again, I get my stories mixed up. Please forgive me if I've told this story. I worked with one board that was a parks and rec uh, uh, district. They had one board member that his deal was soccer. I mean, he was... He had lots of other things to make decisions on, but his deal was soccer. They put in a new soccer field, probably four or five soccer fields. It was a good piece of grass out there. And he made it his business every Tuesday to go out there and advise Juan on how to mow the lawn. He'd be out there every Tuesday morning at 9 o'clock, and he'd say, Juan, come on over here. You know, Juan, that I believe that the right way, I don't know how he got this impression, the right way to mow a lawn is north to south, not east to west. <laughs> See, this, this is a story that the general manager was telling me, but it kind of came true. See, what's Juan to do <laughs> at that moment? When he was kind of getting ready to go in this direction, He'd always done it, or he usually does all of them kind of this way. It had something to do with the way the sprinklers are placed. And a board member comes in and says, now nah, you need to do it the other way. So what does one to do? And that's a question for Phil. What I'm, it's rhetorical, Phil. But it's, 
it's a question for him in does Juan know what to do when a board member comes in and says, why are you using that accounting software? You know, my parent agency uses this one. You, you really ought to take a look at that. Wow, it just messes with a finance director's head. All of a sudden they're saying, they're calling Phil and saying, what am I supposed to do? Is that a direction? Are we supposed to start looking? Should I put together kind of a, a, a look-see of that? That's, this, these are all things that have happened. A newly minted board president that goes out to a water trenching project and says, stop work. And the superintendent says, ah, what am I, uh, this is the night after the board fired the general manager. The attorney got up and said, wait a minute, that's not on the, we, we, we've got some process here to go through. It's not on the agenda. You, the next motion was to fire the attorney. And the next day, she's out there telling the superintendent to stop work on the water extension process that went out to the new development. That the, that the new majority of the board was a, kind of against growth. There's a way we can stop it. Well, turns out there's a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of uh, inertia in that in that process that got them to that point. And they couldn't necessarily stop it, but there was nobody to stop them. And the superintendent didn't have anybody to call. So the superintendent called, called the county supervisor and said, I don't know what to do. We don't have a general manager. We don't have an attorney. I'm the kind of the highest ranking uh, uh, implementer in the district. <laughs> and so it was a real mess. Those are the kinds of things that happen. Now, those are very deliberate and very obvious, but it's a little nuanced things that you can give the impression uh, to. And so there, there, there was something we need to think of as we get in. I mean, if I were to make some suggestion as I toured the wastewater treatment plant, it would have been silly, but it may have been taken serious because we carry a lot more weight than we know at times. <clears throat> so... Go ahead. Did you trench it? They ended up trenching it because the developer got into it real quick and the developer's attorneys got into it even quicker. And there was already a will serve notice. There was all that process had been done. And so they were that close to a lawsuit when the county supervisor actually hired us to place an interim recently retired city manager that knew what to do and he kind of slowed everything down and then what we did do though over time was allow the board to express the kinds of requirements on extending water to growth you, you, you didn't say that before so they just kind of did what you were they were told if you want to tell them something differently, then you need to go through the process to express that. And so we helped them with the public process a little bit too. And they did trench. But well, boy, it was really dicey for a while there. It was quite something. <clears throat> and I don't think, I'm not sure that Juan still isn't seeing that board member every Tuesday morning. Oh man, I, that is, a, I know that that person continues to be reelected and I think they've, they've kind of gone beyond that. Juan says, don't worry. He waves to him as he's going north to south, <laughs> mowing the soccer field. Um, so we should be very careful in how and when you communicate. Careful isn't always about being liked or being friends. And this is one of those interesting situations where you, you want to be liked, you want to be friendly, you want to be... You, you, you want to kind of interact, you're interested in what they do naturally, but you've got to be careful that that interest doesn't turn into some perceived direction or even a, a hint of a distaste for a particular way. Now, if you've got an issue with the way somebody's doing something, you've got a person to talk to. It's Phil. <laughs> <laughs> That's why he's at that focal point, right? He gets it all. He gets it from those coming up. He gets it from you all coming down. 
And that's okay. That's the job he took. That's the role he serves. And he'll do it happily to be able to process that information up and down the organization. <clears throat> Inappropriate trouble uh, communication can be trouble. You often don't know when you may be directing work. Asset management uh, for the GM. Here's the expression that you ought to, as a board, make clear, is that <clears throat> everything in this district, including the employees, are a public asset. Uh, the projector, the carpet, the tables, the asphalt, the employees, the equipment, all of it is the public. It all belongs to them. And so it's your job to be able to be clear with Phil how to optimize the use of those assets. And it's his job to communicate to you and make you feel comfortable in the way those are being optimized. Sounds simple, doesn't it? But it is true. That's the way it ought to work. In that regard, if you look at it from that optic, your employees are an asset. Like the equipment and the facilities and the money, they're assets. They're, there's a huge investment there, public investment in your employees, right? And that's just in order to give you an optic to be able to understand the distance you should keep. You certainly wouldn't, although I've certainly seen it, choose whether or not they buy the Konica or the Minolta copier, right? Or you wouldn't decide that this color carpet's just not doing it for me. You wouldn't micromanage to that level, would you? Or say, no, 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 don't buy any more Chevys. No way, we're buying Fords from now on. Now, some of you might have opinion on that. You might be able to uh, interact and you might have a decision on that. <laughs> but those things happen. The same is true for your employees. You, you, there are times and ways and specific means by which you interact with your employees. And I don't mean to separate them from you, but I certainly don't want to connect them in any particular way other than the appropriate ways with you either. Your manager exec should always be the prime communication node for you. The manager delegates staff level communications. There are natural exceptions, of course. There are everyday social interactions, but not business. How easy is it for a social interaction to get to business? We are one question, one comment away from business. How you doing? That question from you. How's everything going? Well, let me tell you. You really have much time to have. Because this place is great. The fact is that you are not in a position to, to manage that. Now, there are ways that which Phil should make you feel good about the optimization of the workforce, right? And you ask him for that. Oftentimes it's during budget time. Sometimes it's at other times where you say, hey, are we right-sized? Are they getting paid right? Are they, uh, are they managed correctly? Meaning are they, are they getting what they need to be able to flourish as employees here? Those kinds of things. But it always goes through him. <clears throat> Honesty of intentions of those communicating is really the bottom line here. The intention of why I'm communicating. It's easy to want to be the person that's kind of in charge. To be the, yeah, well, I'm a board member there. Yeah, I'm a trustee. So you can talk to me about it. No, shouldn't. Because you put yourself in a, in, in a strained position. You put yourself in a position where you may not no, you may no longer be objective when you need to be. So you should prevent unilateral information about, uh, among board members potentially making uninformed and or choosing sides. What that really means here is that for anyone to want, any one of you to want or need single information more than another is in itself the wrong motive. You, don't, you should all have information about the assets on a similar level. In some cases, the board president has certain places by which uh, uh, he or she need to know more specificity. Certainly, some of the committees need, to more ha have, uh, need more specificity. But other than that, you don't need unilateral information. 
because what it does is it kind of throws your team under the bus when you come, when anybody would come in here and say, well, let me tell you what I heard. I just have to say this from, board, from trustee communications at the end of the meeting. Somebody says, well, I just have to say that I've been talking around. And look, this happens so often, and so that's why it's important to talk about it. And so avoid unilateral information. Certainly, Phil, you should know that as well, and, and in your communication with the trustees. There are only certain examples, sometimes, when that's appropriate. Set an example of how staff should conduct themselves, meaning don't you be the one that introduces the opportunity to talk to you about something that's inappropriate. And if they do try to talk to you about something that's inappropriate, meaning the business or their supervisor or Phil, you set the example by saying, wait a minute, time out. If you've got an issue, I really recommend that you take it up through your management chain. Here's the way that can get a little dicey. There are times when the problem is the management chain. And you don't want to be caught unaware or caught sleeping. But your discussion with Phil about those kinds of dis discussions with employees will help him to be able to see whether or not this is, this is just a data point or this is a, a trend, whether there's actually a line here and an issue that he's got to get to the bottom line uh, or be able to address appropriately with the, with the and I, I used to use the rule of three. If I heard it from one person, I'd send them to the right place. If I heard it from another person, it's, then, I, then I'd definitely talk to the manager. If I heard it from a third, then I'd say, now we need to, we're going to need to talk about this. And, you know, that's always, uh, that's always something that takes its own path. And so it's okay for you when an employee talks to you about a problem, first of all, to back off and say, look, I, I don't deal with employee specific issues, but if you feel uncomfortable with that, Phil's the person you should talk to. And Phil's gonna be rolling up input as well. <clears throat> but set an example by you being the one that knows where the lines are drawn and Phil, it's your job to make sure that the staff knows where the lines are drawn as well. Now, there are certain, there are certain interfaces, I'll get, there are certain interfaces, certainly in the labor uh, uh, representative groups, where there's a very well-determined interface. And there's a very specific way, and, and that can involve even individual board members at times. in that particular vein? <clears throat> Emails are the, <laughs> and texting and I uh, suppose Facebook, oh Facebook. And uh, uh, you know, it's a great thing for the public affairs <laughs> person to be able to get the word out, but there's no limitations to how the word or what the word might be to get it out. Emails are, you, you, Elected or appointed officials need to be very circumspect about emails. And remember, now there's case law where not just your district email is subpoenable, in other words, admissible as evidence, but your personal email is. And so that was te that's been tested uh, for a long time. Oh, no, well, how long has email existed? For the last 30 years, maybe? Uh, but it's been tested a number of times on what's admissible, what, where does a, does a public uh, official get to draw the line. Well, now, in just last year, I believe, there was a case law where even the personal emails were allowed to be, so they just come after you and say, hey, I need all your emails on this. And so how careful do you need to be? And that's not even taking into account the Brown Act limitations of emails, where you can easily reply to all. <laughs> when you reply to all, you've, you, if you've stated a position, you've basically contaminated the process and the board along with it. And it gets very difficult. It's, lighting, it's like... It's a little bit like writing a letter to the editor about an upcoming issue and you state your position in that letter for everyone to see. That, in essence, 
in some respects contaminates the deliberation process of a public agency. Uh, you, uh, these days, and look, I've been out of office four years now. Yeah, four years now, and I, I would be 10 times more careful with emails than I was even when I left office. Because it's just, it's just very difficult to, so filter every email you send as if everybody were going to see it. But don't let everybody see it. <laughs> You've got to be very careful about its path. And have you ever, has, have you ever in your business or personal life had an, had an email go off the rails? And say, oh man, do they have a pullback function? on that, yeah, a do-over, a oops. Well, uh, email is a real difficult thing. And certainly, when it comes from a board to staff, there is no email. There's board to fill. Now, there may be board to don, and there may be board, to, in very limited circumstances, there may be other connections that are appropriate. But even then, you've got to be very careful about, about the message you're sending and what, how you intend on that being taken and how it could be taken in, in the, you know how emails are. They don't really have any uh, directional signs to them. The, the way that they're, the words come out, the way that the words get received, they go out one way, they get received in another way. How careful do you have to be? Set an example, minimize, uh, minimize those in runs around the general manager because you're minimizing legal troubles in doing so. Because there are legal things, there are, don't direct unaware, direct employees unaware. There are limit, uh, limit direct communications, thereby limiting your liability. Board members are meant to act as part of the board, not individually. It's a liability to act individually. You don't have any authority individually either. I, uh, now, that doesn't mean that people don't think you do. That doesn't mean people won't take it that you do, but you don't. But some people kind of dig that. They kind of like the idea that I can go around and people will think that I'm pretty powerful. But legislative immunity is now limited and it's becoming less and less. In fact, there may not be any testing the limits of what used to be legislative immunity of the public official. <laughs> used to be immune from uh, a lot of things. Not so much anymore. Don't think, <laughs> don't get the impression that because you're a public official, you're immune from, uh, from any kind of legal problems. So, invasion of privacy, unfair labor practice, retaliation. <sighs> I don't know if you've ever experienced it, but it, just an email taken in the wrong vein can seem to some as if it's retaliatory. And so I don't know how careful is careful enough. Violating staff's free speech rights. There's a lot to think about there. It really is. Uh, so <clears throat> under, don't undermine board neutrality. Their, their uh, grievance process, the tough compensation decisions. What you want is, as a board is to be objective and neutral going into those and not have anyone else or any of your colleagues or anyone thinking that you've already got info on this that maybe you ha should have, maybe you shouldn't. Don't violate the managerial structure with which to evaluate your manager. Your contract is with the manager. They all, they, the employees, all work for him or her. The board, that's simply board's role versus manager's job. And then ass, it's that asset management we talked about. Inadvertent admissions, your personal liability, you, you can get trapped in that. Misquotations of your comments. I have here in front of you to just to be able to read into the record the email that I got from board uh, trustee X. Wow, I don't want to be trustee X right then. And so, you, you, you're the misquotations of your comments could, could, be, uh, could damage your personal word. Inadvertent direction, bottom line, it's just not the board's job. Just avoid it. And I don't want you to be unfriendly. I don't want you to treat them with 
the distance, but there are, there are controlled, again, think, remember that term, controlled interfaces. As a board member, we, there are controls over how we do that. Refrain from doing so, and advice for you, refrain from doing so unless it's part of one's designated assignment by the board, as a, for instance, a subcommittee. Uh, proceed as part of a properly convened board meeting, not individually, comply with the Brown Act, set the example, get the necessary info from manager, document your intentions in a, as, a, as an agency in the board handbook, and you do. You have a lot of those uh, already uh, dealt with. And let's, okay, let me make sure I, and those are in policy like, thir, uh, if you want to write these down, 30, 20, 30, 50, 20, 80, all of those deal with this interface in one way or another. And so it's there. Consult, if, if, in, if uh, question, you know, there, you can document your intentions in a com communications plan. You've got a great handbook and it does deal with a lot of those things and get help with uh, concerns related to work workforce dissatisfaction. Sometimes if, if that were the case, and there's always a certain m amount of dissatisfaction in a, in a workplace. If, this, if it were really a problem and Phil brought it to you as a real problem, then Phil would get the appropriate help to be able to get to the bottom of that and work through those problems. You just need to be confident that he's got a handle on it. So staff to board. Uh, okay, we were at staff to board. So now we're talking about them to you. Uh, another prevalent difficult area, staff, as I said, Phil, should be made clearly aware on how and when they should and should not communicate with board members. Many stories about that. Managers must make these protocols clear and understandable. Remember the word clarity here. And you, you know, the workforce, the managers, the supervisors, they need to make that clear. There are natural limits, of course. For instance, in a publicly convened meeting, they have a right to express their opinion without fear or reprisal at a public meeting, just like anybody else. <clears throat> There's everyday social interactions, but be honest about intent. And there are some very small agencies that are very small exceptions where Board members need to get in there and actually do the work. Um, it's a rarity, but that does happen. <clears throat> it's a slippery slope, though, so it's one you want to stay off of. The reasons why staff should limit communication with board is the manager's job to perform most communications in either direction. Only legitimate, clearly designated business-related contact with the board. And so there are, as I said, there are certain groups, uh, organized groups, uh, bargaining units, things like that, that have a very, and they have their own rules about how they'll communicate with the board. And the board should have its rules, and that should be very, con it's a controlled interface. But you, the, the employees should understand that they need for the board to be objective at times. And there are times, Rare times, maybe, but labor negotiations is one of them, grievances is another. There are other kinds of times when, um, when, the, uh, uh, when the agency's counsel might need to be involved. Rare instances, though, where staff should have a process for bringing grievances against the executive. And look, that's, I'm not going to say that that doesn't happen at time, but there should be a process for that. And again, a controlled interface. So adopt policy, and you have, you have a number of policies, 2080, 3020, 3080. Um, cl clearly delineate the proper chain of communications. <clears throat> and of course, all this is predicated on the fact that, you know, you can write it all day, but if you don't actually, if it doesn't work. For instance, if an employee if you recommend an employee take it up with their manager, then the presumption is that management will handle it. That's on your part. And so that's on Phil, right? To make sure that this, that below the, uh, below the focal point there, that that's professional staff is, is a thing that works well and communicates uh, properly for a workplace. And, providing clear protocols to staff to pursue, uh, pursue grievances is important. 
um, advice for staff refrain from against almost the same set it's only theirs uh, document communication protocols so developing a communication plan is a, is a kind of a, a deeper dive into when there's it's usually reactionary there's been real problems in the communication area and so an agency does a communication plan so that what we're taking ambiguity and making it clear let, let us be very clear about how communications are supposed to work here for everybody involved. So a communication plan is what does that. Then make proper communications a, a topic fill with the department uh, directors and supervisors and, com and create that f uh, flow up, flow down communication for employees. Be careful not to stifle an employee's constitutional right to address. Now, board to manager, this, this one may be the key for me. I think it's one of the most critical areas of you all as that, that multi-headed boss, being clear with your, uh, with your collective goals and objectives for your manager. Clarity of expectations are key. Everyone in their work wants clarity of expectations. Can we define what success is in my job? Can you, as in your, in your business life, can you, do you have the responsibility to do that for your employees? Absolutely you do. Sometimes they help you with that and that's okay. But the, the, the objective is clarity. So you do that through performance expectations and individual communications, clarity of actions and expectations at board meetings, clarity of overall direction for the district is the board's job and with help. See, the overall direction of the agency in moving this forward becomes the performance expectations of the general manager. <clears throat> If there's clarity up and down through that, then you've, you're, you're in good shape. Sometimes there are places where there's not quite as much clarity in the overall direction. Vision, strategic direction, objectives, goals, strategy, those are the kinds of things. And we're going to talk about a little bit more about this next time. <clears throat> but there's a little consistency in how the performance uh, evaluation is done in districts across the state. But it remember, it's important to remember this is an executive level evaluation. It's, it, it, many of us do rank and file over the years, have done rank and file evaluations of, of, of specific jobs. But an executive, what's required of an executive is results and achievements. Stay within the law, don't make, don't make enemies, and get these, obje these results and achievements done. And you're, that's how we define success for your job. <clears throat> but doing it confirms the board's understanding of the job. It kind of presumes that it confirms the board's understandings of priorities and direction and expectations. The best opportunity for the board to have a frank discussion about performance with well-defined goals and objectives is when you do that performance evaluation. And this goes for your home agencies too. If uh, some of you are, uh, come from other home agencies, you have executive directors or city managers or administrators that also need this clarity. Absent this, they're kind of out there hoping that they stay within the lane. But, um, develop a consistent, uh, well-developed, clear and fair process to use each year. It provides the basis for salary administration as well, so there's accountability there. By doing this, we feel good about what we're doing there. It also provides a legal basis where necessary on the other end of that spectrum where it may not be such, a, such good news, but evaluating the performance is something that's hugely important. <clears throat> it's rarely done well, unfortunately. One would think that public agencies have kind of a template for doing this. Not so. They almost all do it just a little bit differently. In fact, most of them do it a lot differently. And some of them are very good and some of them aren't so good. Because one thing that, that optimizes the public dollar maybe more than anything is the clarity for fill. And how, because remember, most of the public dollar is being, 
Forgive me, Phil. Is being spent by Phil. Right? He directs the, the most of the public, maybe all of the public dollar that's raked. You, however, direct him. So the clarity of those expectations is, is absolutely crucial in terms of optimizing the performance, optimizing the, the performance of each and every dollar. Goals and objectives should fit within the overall direction of the agency. And here's the question, do you know the overall direction of your agency? These allow the managers to be most productive because ma a manager can take it to his or her managers and they can be productive at moving in a very particular direction and making sure that they're staying within the boundaries of the board's highest priorities. It demonstrates accountability. The reasonable question herein is in absence of goals and objectives, what is it that we're working to? So you should never be able to, uh, you should never uh, have to answer that question um, in a negative way. You should be able to be able to say, yes, we have very clear goals and objectives for our executive every year. It's critical for new GMs and board members, board relations. This is a hugely important part and oftentimes not done. Um, so clarity at board meetings. And this is between the board and the manager. Manager, strive to get clear consensus. So it, during a meeting, strive to make sure, Phil, that you get clear consensus on direction provided by the board. Here's what can happen, is that somebody right at the last minute, right after the vote, just before the president says, now we're gonna talk about agenda item number five, don't forget about this, and they move on. Happens all the time. Or there'll be a comment that really is a sidebar to the issue that was there that becomes almost direct, directive from the board. That's the time when the people that have responsibility for the public process, Phil and the board president, have, re have responsibility for the public process. They time out, wait a minute, did we have a comment there? Is it on, is it within this agenda item? And does that send us in any different direction than what the board just said? All direction should come from the board as a whole. <clears throat> so, verbally, sometimes, Phil, you may, you may need to verbally reflect you heard as direction from the whole board. There are times, there are moments. But don't, don't show up at the staff meeting the next day and look around at staff and say, does anybody really know what happened on agenda item number four? See, that's, a bad, that's not public efficiency there. The public dollar just took a hit. <clears throat> uh, Phil, you should provide clear requests of the board on each agenda item. What do we need, what do we as staff, what do I as your manager need from you out of this? so that the president can assure that the process gets to that. And Mr. President, you can assure that the board provided direction to manage as a full board, not unilaterally. You can say, now, do we have clarity here in terms of which way we're going? There's not gonna be any unilateral direction. Here as well, Mr. President, assure that manager and staff are clear with the outcome or direction of board discussion, timing, and or decision before proceeding to the next agenda item. I, adopted a policy early on in my mayorship to where I said, now does everybody, before we vote on this, does everybody, anybody have questions? Anybody from the public, anybody from council, staff, do you have everything on the table you need to get on the table? We vote. Does everybody have what they need here? Because let's make sure we're all open about what's going to happen. We take the vote. Okay, here's the direction. Do we all have clarity over what's going to happen next, where this goes, what's going to happen? And so that just moment, that it just takes a moment to do it. But in some cases, it's very, very important to be able to assure that we're on track and we stay on track. Now manage your board. Get a feel for your individual board member's specific interest. With department heads, determine information that can be useful to the board between meetings. And I've seen you demonstrate that with your PR in the last couple of meetings and with the drone thing, that, you, that was very cool. Linda and I re referred to the drone thing a number of times because we got to watch it too. Um, 
But, you know, you, what is really important information for the board and useful for them in between meetings? Everybody gets it. Everybody gets information. Always share information evenly. Be proactive in asking the board to determine the collective direction for the agency. In other words, if there's any ambiguity in where you should be going, then I believe that it's a manager's responsibility to be proactive in asking the board to assert that collective direction. Work proactively with your board president, which I know you do, attend community events and meetings to determine issues and concerns that you all out in the, out in the community may be picking up on. Uh, the, uh, Phil, this is to you again. I, there's a piece in here for you. You know that the, the board doesn't like surprises or time traps. Time traps are really bad. You have to make the decision tonight. I'm sorry, I know this last minute, but you have to make this decision tonight. And I know you only have so much information, but there's a ticking time bomb at the end of this. And if you don't make it, boards hate that. And you should at all costs try to avoid that. I know you can't always avoid that, but you should try. Talk to the board about background, possibilities, options, and impacts. Get in front of the issues with informational items that you can and get out to them. Lead the board to help you and everyone else better understand the overall direction and working on those lines of communication. I'm sorry these didn't line up, but cons consistent, that shouldn't be shred, that should be shared. Shared information. There's, a, there's another whole topic there, shred information. Uh, committee meetings, practice different methods, news releases, memos. Again, you all are pretty, you have that nailed down pretty well. Now, communicating with the public. Let's see if this works. Did I do this last time? And it didn't work. Okay, I'm going to make this thing work. Is none of the government's business. No, no. Well, 
Yeah, you know, actually it is. Well, you don't know my name or what I look like, so good luck finding me. How do we know you're really a nurse? I am, I promise. I work at St. Joe's. Well, the point is, my friend thinks you're cute. Give me your number so he can have it. Yeah, that's not gonna happen. Can I have your email address? Oh I my just God. got AOL. No. My dog went to one of your parks and ate another dog's feces, and I'm going to sue you for that. This <laughs> that's happening here is not allowed. Oh, shut up, Kelly! Make me, Bob! Hey, my pretzels suck. Is there going to be basketball there? Basketball courts attract undesirables to my community. Why don't we just set fire to the fence, you know? Set it ablaze? That's arson. Well, let's leave that up for lawyers. The point is, it would work. I want to put her ashes in the time capsule. If the governor can tax me, I, I, can, I can do this. Grover, give that woman her purse back. There's a lot of pill bottles in here. So your department banned me from attending games just because I yell you suck at the players. According to the complaint, you yelled it at five-year-old girls. Who suck? Why is that so hard to understand? <laughs> well, that's the end of it. I, I, it was uh, all, all obviously tongue-in-cheek. But I don't know if you've ever been in public, um, in, in the middle of public meetings, something like that. <laughs> In my professional life, in my in my public life, I know some of your staff members have been have seen something like it. It's not easy to work with the public. They, there's a lot of opinion out there, and yeah, this is all pretty funny, but some of it actually happens. I think that it's hard to be prepared sometimes. If you ever want to, by the way, it's a it's a fabulous rainy Saturday afternoon activity to YouTube bad boards or bad councils. <laughs> you see all the examples of how bad it can get and how difficult some of these things are to deal with at times. And you know, how, what should our position be at that point? What should, and I know Bill, you and staff, when you have public meetings, you, you've got to be able to draw in that and be that leader, be that professional face for the agency. Maybe not this one so much, but I know <laughs> there are times when managers feel that way. But it's not easy working with the public, but they have a right to communicate with the board. All of them do. They're the owners. At board meetings, there's two, there's, don't forget there's two kinds of, of, of general information that the, that the public can address, off agenda and on agenda. And you all should know the difference, and Mr. President, you certainly should too. And here's why I tell you, because off agenda items are clarifying only. In other words, anyone wishing to address the, the board on items not on the agenda may do so now. And there's a long thing that you'll read there, I believe. And so when that person does, it's not on the agenda. The rest of the public doesn't know that that item is going to be dealt with. So it's not on the agenda. So you can have controls over that. And quite frankly, how you interact and deal with that, you can ask clarifying questions. It should always, those questions should be through the chair. But don't forget it's not agendized. On the agenda, uh, through the chair only, allow for public input. And you do that through your agenda development, where you have an item where, would anybody from the public like to address this? And it doesn't happen all the time. Uh, I was kind of bathed in that because our city was growing a lot at the time, and there was lots of public at our meetings. Hundreds of people were at our meetings, and it was it was about managing their input, and that, that was uh, it, it happens a lot. Both types should be managed with protocols. If you have time limits, speaker cards, policies in your board manual, uh, manual with some detail, and so I believe that uh, you've already dealt with a lot of those things, and you have. Um, yeah, you have protocols in 3020 and 3040. Um, Mr. Chair, Mr. President, maintain control and being consistent. Uh, when you anticipate a meeting with a lot of people in it, you need to be prepared for that because sometimes it can come, it, it can easily go off the rails if the board doesn't maintain its position. And if the process by which you step through that decision isn't done in all fairness and things can come off the rails really quick or uh, according to your own rules of order which are Rosenberg's rules of order 
Make sure you understand those. Make sure you're the expert in the room, not somebody else that's out there at the podium. Okay. In your jurisdiction, when you're out there in your areas, know that you'll be approached, so be approachable. <coughs> Always listen attentively. <laughs> Most of you cannot do anything unilateral, right? Uh, you know you can't really solve the issue, but be prepared to find the right pathway for issues. And the pathway for issues here is in uh, uh, policy 2060. You've dealt with how you're supposed to deal with public issues, and basically they go back to Phil. Make sure he knows them. Most really, most of the public want to be heard. They want to know that they have access to you, and you should always allow and provide for that access. Communicating the district direction. And we're going to talk more about this next time, but it really is about the long-term planning and where the agency is going over the next X number of years. And it can be assembled, assembled in a number of different ways. Many agencies uh, do an annual plan that plots a point, but really doesn't set a direction. Who needs this? Basically, everyone needs to know it. The manager's staff is the one of the most important. The public would like to know where it's going. Employees want to know where it's going. Regulators, lab coach, manager, county, you name it. They want to know if there's some plan here, if there's some direction for the agency. And so that's why it's an important part of this, of this training. A good commu a plan communicates what this district is about, committed to, and what we mean by results and where it's going. Demonstrates that we have things planned and are working. <clears throat> so consider looking into the future for more than one or two years. And we're going to talk about, again, we're going to talk about this more uh, next time we're together. And so the last one here is communication policy and protocols. And you have a great uh, manual that you've worked on very hard. I think I said before that you should keep it fresh. Don't let it sit too long because things can come apart and things can can uh, be outdated. One of those uh, we emails are one of those things that uh, our digital social media can drive a lot of the way in terms of communication. And so sometimes that needs to be put into our manual. Make sure you, you can consider at some point in time perhaps a communication plan. Make sure that you do a general manager evalu a performance evaluation well, as we discussed earlier. You certainly have an employee manual, and that's important for us. Uh, some of you to understand as the committee on that. New board member orientation is a strong point because really new board member orientation is an opportunity to really have a very deliberate plan in how we indoctrinate new board members in. And this, this happens more here than in lots of other agencies. And so doing that well is really, really an opportunity point for you. Uh, the new board member orientation, and then a long-term strategic plan. So there are the ways and different areas of critical communication, and as I said, it can go, it can get good, or it can be come off the rails really quickly. But clearly, uh, it's a huge area of organizational vulnerability, and so you want to make sure that you've spent time thinking about it as an ag as an agency, both board and, and <coughs> staff. There's plenty for all to get involved. But if left to evolve or left unattended, poor communications will not self-heal. They don't get better, they get worse. And so it's really important that if you ever identify any place where there's poor communication, whether it's in a meeting or among yourselves, with your manager or with the public, you need to deal with it. And that means time and, and effort. But if, if you've done what you've, if you do what you've always done, you'll get what you always got. And so don't ignore this. Um, I realize it's not a, com a comprehensive communication uh, class, but uh, uh, it was an introductory kind of thing, but proactively managed can support many of the efficiency effectiveness goals that any agency has. But poor communication can grow into a mess. Feel free to contact me about anything. Check out, there's weekly training that's delivered uh, by this service on a uh, weekly basis. You might check out that website. And, and there's just helps you to be able to continue doing well uh, uh, and considering your, uh, your role as a board member. Um, back to the beginning, which was communicate with respect. 
that was one of the major things that I brought up early. And the other one I think that I want you to make sure of is controlled interfaces. You have controlled interfaces by in your role as a board member. Yes. Forty-four and forty-five. Uh -huh. yep. yeah. Okay. Do, do you know? Is it not there? Uh, well, those will be. Those will be forthcoming. Forty-four and forty-five. Thank you for that. I'll make sure we get that to you. It could be a. Let. No, I'm not going to blame anybody else. It's my fault. So. Um, 